Good morning. So good to have you with us this morning as we continue in our study of, of the Gospel of Luke. I want to welcome you. Uh, if you got your Bible handy, just go ahead and pick up your Bible and let's turn to Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 1. Before we begin our, our study, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this day that, that you have given to us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and, and to open your word together, to discuss freely its meaning, and, and to help us, Lord, to understand your will for our lives. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts as we do this this morning. Help us to understand the meaning of this passage. And Lord, help us to understand the, the many timeless truths that are in this passage and understand them well, because these are the things of our salvation. They are important for us to learn and to understand. Lord, give us opportunity to share these with other people. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we left off last week in Luke chapter 22, after the Jewish Sanhedrin had arrested Jesus and, and held an illegal trial for him at the home of the high priest, as soon as it was daylight, they took Jesus to the temple complex and had a... a a mock trial there at the complex, at the Sanhedrin's chambers. And there they condemned Jesus to death for blasphemy. Now as we come today, we see in verse 1 of chapter 27, then the whole body of them, and that's the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, plus the temple guards and anyone else who happened to be there that morning early, right at sunup, they got up and they brought Jesus before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor, and in order for them to sentence Jesus to death, it had to be done by Pilate. They only had the authority to administer the death penalty except for religious reasons, and they did not want to be responsible before, for that because they did, were afraid of the crowds that were there in Jerusalem for Passover. We look at verse 2, and we see that the charges that they brought to Pilate against Jesus were, number one, they said he forbade paying of taxes to Rome, and number two, he claimed to be the Messiah or the Christ who was a king, implying insurrection against the emperor of Rome. Now we come down to verse 3, and we see Pilate interrogating Jesus. We get a much fuller account of this much longer interrogation that is recorded in John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38, if you want to read that later. John says of the Jewish religious leaders, they themselves would not enter into the praetorium where, where the Roman offices were and, and where Pilate was, so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. We see that in John 18, 28. Come down to verses 4 through 5. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. So that brings us down to verses 6 and 7, such that when Pilate, as soon as Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee, he immediately took the opportunity to send Jesus before Herod, the Roman assigned tetrarch of Galilee. 
Now we, in verses 8 through 12, we see Jesus before Herod. I don't want to take a lot of time there because the bottom line is that that Jesus would not answer a single question that Herod gave to him. And Herod became angry and frustrated and sent him back to Pilate in verse 11. As we come down to verse 13, we see the second hearing of Jesus before Pilate. In verses 13 through 15, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. He called them all back before him when Jesus came back and said to him, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death, has been done by him. Verse 16, Pilate said, Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now jump down to verses 18 and 19, and we read, But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. And now we come down to verses 20 through 23. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept calling out, saying, Crucify! Crucify Him! And He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have not, I've found in Him no guilt demanding death, therefore I will punish Him and release Him. But they were insistent with loud voices, asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And then in verses 24 and 25, And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for, Barabbas, who had been thrown in jail in prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Now we come down to Luke 23, 26 through 32. And this, in this, Luke records Jesus' trip down the Via Della Rosa. In verse 26, it's when they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Jesus was so physically torn up and and, and exhausted from from the whipping that the Romans had given him with the with the whips that he was not able to carry his cross. And so Simon of Cyrene was pressed into service to do just that. So that brings us down to chapter 23, verse 33. It says, And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. The pronoun they, in verse 33, included the Jewish religious leaders, the Roman execution squad, Jesus, two other criminals that were scheduled for execution that day, and just a few of Jesus' faithful followers, mostly women. The other go- Gospels give actual Aramaic, the, Ar- the actual Aramaic Hebrew name of the location where the Romans performed their crucifixions in Jerusalem. Golgotha, rendered in English Golgotha, was that Aramaic Hebrew name. The Greek word translated skull, in coming out of Luke's text, is the Greek word kranion, 
where we get our English word cranium. The English word Calvary is a Latin term literally meaning skull. Golgotha may have been a skull-shaped hill or it may have been, have been so named because as a place of crucifixion it had accumulated many human skulls. We don't know why it was called Golgotha. None of the actual, actual Gospels call this place a hill. In fact, the Romans typically crucified in a public place near a main thoroughfare where the maximum number of people could witness, be witness to the terrible, dreadful punishment meted out by the Roman occupational government against insurrectionists. All of the gospel writers simply say Jesus was crucified there. Uh, they don't give the details of what, physical details of what happened. We know from Roman historical records that the way they did this is the soldiers would have suspended the condemned person from the cross by driving nails through the wrists, which they considered a part of the hand. So the, in the translations, oftentimes, it will say that he, they drove the, the spikes into the hand, but the, the Romans really like to drive it right here between these two bones and the arm. Okay, And the person went, then they drove spikes into the person's feet on the bottom part of the cross, and the person was suspended from those, those spikes driven through their body. The Roman historical records also state that a number of victims would live as long as two days on the cross before they died. They, death came from blood loss, exposure, dehydration, and finally total exhaustion. Re resulting in asphyxi asphyxiation. So the person could not breathe any longer, could not draw breaths. And, and Jesus had lived... Now, now Jesus, looking at him, let's, let's talk about the, the injustice in this. Jesus had lived a perfectly sinless life. He is the only person who has ever done that. Therefore, he's the only person to ever live who did not deserve physical death, which is what God commanded beginning with Adam and Eve and all of their descendants, which includes me and includes you. Yet Jesus was crucified for crimes he never committed. Between two criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Therefore, the prophecy... In Isaiah 53, 12, which Isaiah gave about 700 years before the coming of Jesus, that prophecy was fulfilled in that it said there that the Messiah in his death would be numbered with the transgressors. But these two criminals, they were like each one of us. We each including them, have forfeited our lives by our own choices to sin. We see that while hanging on the cross, Jesus was mocked by every unbelieving bystander. We look at verse 34. But Jesus was saying, as he was being mocked by the bystanders, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This statement shows that Jesus was focused on his godly, the godly purpose of his death, the forgiveness of the sins of all humanity. For those around the cross hearing it that day, Jesus' Jesus's prayer probably was interpreted by them as a reference to those present those who were responsible for his crucifixion, the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman soldiers. But truthfully, every human being 
other than Jesus who has ever lived is totally dependent upon God to free us by His grace from our sin debt to Him. Only Jesus could pay the debt for our sins that we cannot pay. Jesus willingly accepted my death sentence and your death sentence in order to redeem you and me, buying our opportunity to be forgiven by God before we even knew our hopeless predicament that was caused by our sins. This emphasizes the loving, gracious nature of God who will forgive even the most heinous of sin if the person will only repent to God and believe in the sacrifice made for our sins by the death of His Son, Jesus. In the second half of verse 34, it says that they cast lots, dividing up His garments among themselves. It was customary for Roman soldiers working a crucifixion detail to divide up the last of the crucified person's possessions, including his clothing. This was prophesied of the Messiah a full 1,000 years earlier through King David, where David writes in Psalm 22, verse 18, of the Messiah, they divided my garments among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. Now we come down to Luke 23, verse 35. And we learn some other important things that went on during this time of Jesus' crucifixion. In verse 35 it says, And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at Him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. While hanging on the cross, we see here that there were people who stood by looking on. The watchers who stood nearby included a few of Jesus' supporters. At least one of Jesus' disciples, John, was present. There was Mary, Jesus' mother, and several other of the women who followed Jesus. But as far as we know, the rest of the disciples were nowhere near. They had fled to hide to make sure that they did not meet this same fate. Jesus was mocked by most all of the unbelieving bystanders from the crowd who had cried, Crucify Him to Pilate. So Jesus was mocked first by the religious, the rulers. The religious rulers of the people were sneering at Him. These were the ones who knew the Hebrew Scriptures and the prophecies which against fantastic odds were all fulfilled in Jesus. These religious ones who were mocking Jesus also knew about the huge crowds of people who believed Him to be the King who comes in the name of the Lord as the, as the throngs coming into Jerusalem for Passover proclaimed on Palm Sunday, Luke 19.38. They had seen this happen. Many of these religious rulers had also seen and heard about Jesus healing the sick, the blind, the crippled, the demon-possessed, and even raising the dead, like in the case of Lazarus. In verse 35, Yet they stood there in their unmitigated arrogance, 
sneering at Jesus and saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. These religious rulers and many of the Jews of their day generally believed that the real Messiah would appear in power and set them free from Roman rule. They believed that their Messiah would have been able to save himself. They refused to accept the bleeding Messiah hanging on a cross. The religious leaders did not understand the word saved in terms of spiritual salvation. They were thereby affirming that Jesus had indeed healed the sick and raised the dead. To them, such a mighty reputation bore little truth as they watched his life ebbing away before them. They had the audacity to dare Jesus to prove to them that he was the Messiah by saying it, by saving himself. They were confident in the saving power of their own actions and words according to their human traditions. Now come down to verses 36 through 39. The soldiers also mocked Jesus, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So not only was Jesus mocked by the religious, Jesus was also mocked by the sacrilegious. In verse 39, we are told by Luke that both of the criminals on either side of him were at first mocking Jesus. The criminals were saying, Are you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Also in verse 39, one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at him. The, so what we see by this is that the, the sacrilegious are the ones that we expect to mock God and His Christ. After all, they knew little and believed nothing about God's Word as found in the Scriptures. Thirdly, we see that Jesus is mocked by the worldly. In Matthew 26, 67, in Matthew's account, even before the crucifixion, the soldiers kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him. In so doing, these worldly individuals actually knelt before the King of Kings, the sovereign ruler of the universe and blasphemed his holy name. Verses 36 and 37, they used sour wine mixed with a sedative to cruelly tease Jesus, saying to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. In verse 34, they cast lots and divided up his garments among themselves. Themselves. The reason was is because in John chapter, 20, chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, John tells us that Jesus had a, a very valuable continuous weave tunic. And they wanted the tunic. They were worldly individuals. And worldly individuals generally believe that there are many ways to God they're universalists, or they believe that there's no God at all. Either way, they generally have no moral compass at all. Anything goes for them, depending upon the circumstances they are personally experiencing at the time. 
So Jesus is mocked by the worldly. Lastly, number four, Jesus is also mocked by the politically correct. Pilate believed Jesus to be innocent and could have freed him but succumbed to political pressure to turn him over to be crucified. In verse 38, Pilate sarcastically wrote a political epithet for the top of Jesus' cross. And putting together all four gospel accounts, we deduce that the full inscription read, This is Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Also, Pilate had the political correctness to, to write it in Greek, which is the language of worldly education and culture. He wrote it in Latin, the Roman language of worldly power. And thirdly, he even had the audacity to write it in Hebrew, the language of God's Word in Scripture. It is likely that this was Pilate's way of mocking the Jewish leaders, their mock trial and their political, politically motivated murder of an innocent man. But remember, Pilate had the authority to release Jesus. And for politically correct reasons, he went ahead and, and succumbed to their pressure and turned Jesus over to be crucified. Now before we start jumping all over these people who are mocking Jesus, we need to realize that there is a total depravity in every single person while he or she is still lost in sin. In this state in which each and every one of us has been, we have neither an understanding of our desperate spiritual situation, nor do we have a desire for God. We each need God to intervene and to enable us to understand spiritual truth. But we read in Romans ch chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank God that Christ Jesus was willing to take our sin debt upon Himself. Jesus was willing to obey His Father to receive this defiant abuse by rebels who rebelled against all that is godly and to die in the place of each one of us. The innocent died for the guilty. The one and only perfect Lamb of God, Christ Jesus, became the perfect and final sacrifice for all human sin. So now we come down to verses 40 through 43. And we see that there is immediately a result that is tied directly to the sacrifice through Jesus, the Son of God, for human sin. Look at verses 40 and 41. After a while, one of the two criminals that was hanged on either side of Jesus rebuked the other for continuing to mock Jesus, saying, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. 
But this man has done nothing wrong. These are amazing words that are spoken by this, this criminal convicted of murder who is being executed. How did he understand these spiritual truths? These criminals, like each one of us, had forfeited their lives for their choice to sin against God and God's ways. Something truly amazing has happened in this one of the two criminals who suddenly stopped mocking Jesus and rebuked the other criminal for doing so. That man somehow realized that Jesus, <clears throat> unlike them, <clears throat> excuse me, that Jesus, unlike them, was innocent. That man suddenly realized that Jesus had been sent from God. <clears throat> that man realized that he himself deserved to die for his own sin. The words spoken by this criminal are the words of personal repentance. That man was testifying that he had turned from following his own sinful ways to thinking and believing in Jesus and following God's ways. In Romans 10, 9, we read, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. In verse 42, we read, And the repentant criminal was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. This criminal knew a couple of things that are key to our understanding of this. He knew that both he and Jesus were going to die within just a few minutes to hours. The man had heard that the Jewish religious leaders were saying all of these, these things to mock Jesus as he hung there on the cross. This criminal deduced from what they were saying and the leading of his heart by God's Holy Spirit as he hung there on this instrument of his own death, that Jesus is the one Christ sent by God to save all of us. Perhaps the man had heard some of the statements or the sayings of Jesus, but we do know that this man came to an understanding that Jesus and only Jesus held the keys to the kingdom of God. The man believed now that Jesus would live on after his death and even the death that Jesus was suffering. The man was confessing his belief that Jesus held power over the grave and was the giver of eternal life. Now, God's Holy Spirit opened the man's eyes to the truth of who Jesus really is. Now, think about this. This man had nothing to offer Jesus. He was only going to live for, at most, a few more hours. He couldn't promise, oh, I'll live the rest of my life for you if you'll just save me. I'll follow you each and every day if you'll just save me. I'll do all these good things in, the, in your name if you will just save me. He had nothing that he could offer to Jesus. So he turned to Jesus in simple faith. 
What was the result? Look at verse 43. Jesus accepted the man's simple statements of faith, saying, Truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. This statement by Jesus continues to hold significance throughout the, the intervening 2,000 years to today. It holds significance for me and it holds significance for you. Notice, Jesus said today, there is no purgatory, there is no soul sleep, there is no opportunity on the other side of death to make things right with God. Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed for people to die once and then comes judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.8 gives us the converse of that statement where Paul wrote, I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. That is the place that we all long to be our eternal residence. Verse 43 Look at that again. Jesus said to the man, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The word you in the Greek is singular. Salvation is an absolutely very personal and individual understanding between Christ Jesus and the individual person. My salvation, your salvation, is by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. There's not any sort of good works you will ever do that will earn your salvation, that will earn your forgiveness. Only faith in the work of Jesus Christ. The object of saving faith is in Jesus Christ alone and His redemptive work on the cross. Now look at the results of this. Because of His his repentance to Jesus from His sinful ways and, and, and turning from those and rejecting those, and his faith placed in Jesus, all of this man's transgressions were instantly forgiven by God's grace. As long as a person lives, God's invitation to come to him stands open. To receive life with Christ Jesus in his kingdom, one must recognize his or her personal guilt before God, and that he or she has no hope of after death from God's, but only from God's grace will we receive forgiveness through repentance and faith in the redemptive work of Jesus. The other thing that we see here is that heaven, or as he expressed it there, as Jesus expressed it there, paradise is a very real place. And it is forever. It will never end. Now the use of the Jesus using the word paradise throws an amazing contrast to the horrible world that this man had known and as this horrible death that he was dying. Jesus used the word paradise because on the other side of the veil in the presence of the holy God is an ideal garden 
referred to as heaven oftentimes, a beautiful place where every believer will live forever in perfect relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We will know Him perfect, perfectly there and we'll be in perfect relationship with Him. There will be no more sin and we will never be divided again because of sin. Because all of our sin is put away. Now we come down to verses 44 through 46. Verses 44 and 45, it was about the sixth hour. A darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. We get a little more detail from the other accounts, the other scriptural accounts of the, of the crucifixion from Matthew, Mark, and John. The sixth hour is noon, according to a Jewish method of reckoning time. The crucifixion had begun about 9 a.m. Uh, throughout the Bible, another thing that we want to understand looking at this is that darkness symbolizes evil and its resultant spiritual death which is separation from the Holy God. We even see in the oldest, the first written book of the Bible, Job, that Job speaks to this understanding of darkness that comes as a result of sin. In Job 3, verse 5. In Matthew 27, 46, he also clarifies for us that at noon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it was at noon when the darkness fell over the land that Jesus is also crying out because God the Father has turned his back on his son Jesus who was at that time bearing the sins of the world. God the Father had separated himself from Jesus. Jesus was paying the price required by God for sin. Disconnect or separation from God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says it this way. God made him, Christ Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We also know from 2 Thessalonians 1.9 what hell really is. This is the eternal destiny of all those who reject the Son of God, Jesus, and His redemptive work. In 2 Thessalonians 1.9 it says, These, those who reject Jesus, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. In Matthew 27, 50, it tells us that at the ninth hour, which is what the Jewish people call twilight or 3 o'clock p.m., Jesus cried out again saying, It is finished. Verse 46 from our text, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now let's take a step back for just a moment. Jesus, being the Son of God, had the power to stop this mockery of justice at any time. Jesus though freely lay down his life for his sheep. No one took 
his life from him. He laid it down freely for you and for me. We see that Jesus saying those very words in John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. I invite you to go and read those after we finish this, this study. At 3 o'clock p.m. or twilight, it would have been the exact time when a ram's horn would have been heard sounding from the temple, signifying the time of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Therefore, all the people in Jerusalem. This day was the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. The day of the preparation of the Passover meal. 1,445 years before that day, God had commanded all of His people that they were on the 10th day of that month to take a lamb. And he goes on to say in, in Exodus 12, verse 5, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old or a young adult lamb. In verse 6 it says, You shall keep that lamb until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight, 3 o'clock p.m. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. In verse 13, the blood of the lamb shall be assigned to you on the houses where you live. And when you see the blood, God promises, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land. At the ninth hour, three o'clock p.m., twilight, God lifted the darkness that had passed over the land. In John 1.29, when John the Baptist, who knew the, the, this passage of the Passover very, very, very well, when he first saw Jesus coming down to the Jordan River, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus is the Lamb of God, slain as the ultimate and final sacrifice for human sin. If you believe in Him as such, no plague will befall you to destroy you. You will have eternal life. In verse 45b, it also says that that same moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Matthew and Mark add that it was torn in two from top to bottom. That veil was 30 feet tall. So it could only have been torn that way by God Himself. The veil in the temple was at the entrance to the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. And it was torn in two by God from top to bottom. Entry into God's presence has been from then on granted to anyone who will accept Jesus Christ's redemptive work of love and grace on faith. Jesus is now our high priest who has seated himself at the right hand of the Father in heaven, there to make intercession for you and me while we are still on this side of the veil. For all those who believe who are still on this side of the veil, believers in Jesus Christ no longer need a mortal man to act as a priest for us. 
But you and I can now, as believers in Jesus Christ and having received forgiveness of our sin, we can now enter boldly into the very presence of God through the eternal Christ Jesus and His Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us. We now can live in relationship with God. Make that decision today. If you've never made this decision, I invite you today to be just like that that criminal hanging on that cross next to Jesus. Realize your sinfulness. Realize that it is that 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 separates you from the Holy God who keeps you from knowing how, what to do, and the right things to do in life, and also empowers you to resist the temptation to walk away and do evil things, but to stay following God and His ways. Repent of that. Give your life to Jesus Christ as Lord, and believe that God has raised Him from the dead and will do the same for you. Will give you eternal life such that you will pass through that veil into the very presence of God in the day that this old body gives it up. I invite you. It's as easy as that. Simply tell God. Tell Him you repent and you're believing in His Son Jesus and that you will then be saved. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done on the cross. Lord Jesus, a work that, that only you, the, son of, the sinless Son of God, could do. Lord, you have paid that price as the, the innocent lamb that was slain, the lamb of God. And Lord, we each thank you for the salvation that you give to us if we would but repent of our sinfulness and believe in you. Lord, you will come and take residence within us and that you will guide our hearts and our minds each and every moment of each and every day for the rest of all of eternity. Lord, we thank you for this. This is This is the most, this is the greatest thing, the greatest thing that we will ever know and experience. Lord, we ask you to speak to those that we love who do not know you, that you would convict them of their need for you, and that, Lord, you would give us an opportunity to to tell them this amazing story that we've read directly from your word, in Luke chapter 23. Lord, guide our lives, guide our hearts. Help us, Lord, to live for you. And we look forward to that great day when we will see you face to face in paradise. It's in Jesus' great name that we pray and ask these things. Amen.